Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for a special edition of the show. So a few months ago, I'm going to say like maybe two, three months ago, um, I got an email asking if I would be interested in doing a book review. Um, and I've done the occasional book review here and there. I actually got two emails. I got one for the book we're about to do and one for another book. I never got the other book, so that's okay. No big deal. Um, so anyway, so this is the book that I, I spent the past, now that I got, you know, once I got back from Provine and I was taking care of much stuff, uh, I started reading this book and I kind of, you know, read it, you know, in bits and pieces. So this is a field guide to 75 perfect pairings, cheese, beer, wine, cider by Steve Jones and Adam uh, Lindsley. Um, and this was a really cool book. So um, they first start off with, kind of talking about cheeses and beer, cider, wine, give you like a basic primer, primer, whatever you want to call it, about it and how to eat cheese and how to do all this other stuff. Um, but I'm going to kind of um, go through and um, tell you who Steve Jones is. Um, he is, he, uh, he runs this place called um, Cheese Bar in, at Cheese Bar in, Chizu, my shop's in Portland, Oregon, which I might be going to Oregon later this later this year. So if I do, Steve, I need, I need to probably stop by and say hi to you. Um, and maybe do a proper interview. That'd be awesome. He serves wine with 250 varieties of cheese. Uh, he also serves beer and cider, both on tap and in bottles. So um, he's a big proponent of having these types of pairings. Um, and he's been doing cheese for a really long time. And uh, he started he started uh, doing this in the mid '90s when he was uh, working in a fantastic wine shop in St. Louis called the Wine Merchant. Um, and he said every day they sold magnificent vintages from uh, the premier winemaking regions of the world. Then the challenge was given to him to create and curate a cheese counter that focused not only on the classic cheeses of Europe, uh, but also the wonderful art American artisan and farmstead cheeses. Uh, that were having a rebirth. Um, so he kind of, uh, so he basically that's what he started. He started doing all that stuff. And then he goes through and uh, he has like the nine rules of buying, storing, and serving cheese. Rule number one, uh, buy what you can use in a week. Makes sense. Uh, don't, don't freeze it. Serve cheese at room temperature. So I've had these out for well, the entire last week's episode. And then a little bit more than that. So they're not truly room temperature, but they're not like ice cold. Uh, serve cheese on wood, which I don't think you really tell. But I just have a cutting board. Um, so I thought it'd be kind of fancy. Uh, don't pre-cut the cheese because that kind of stinks. No, no. Um, no, these cheeses are still... I mean, they're cut from the original, like how they were cut from where I got them. They're not the actual like... I didn't like have a whole round of them. Uh, don't worry about fancy knives. Okay, I just got a steak knife. Uh, arrange cheese by depth and flavor. So I'm actually doing this by how they were paired in the order of the book. So we're going to do the beer pairing, the wine pairing, and then the cider pairing. Keep the accompaniment simple. They say glass of water. Okay. Crackers. I didn't get any crackers. Bread, nuts, milk. We're not doing all that. Um, store left leftovers in an airtight container. Um, and he really kind of talks about like if you storing in the fridge, not the best thing. Unfortunately, I don't really have airtight containers for all these things. I'm going to crush as much of these cheeses tonight, not necessarily on camera, but as tonight. Um, and then wrap them really tight in, in plastic, which he, which is a no, no, by the way, which he says, try to avoid that. Um, but you know, this, the reality is, for me to hold these for another couple days, you know, tomorrow 
um, tomorrow's May 2nd. Yeah, I did all these in the same day, these last three weeks. Um, I'll be out of town. And uh, so the earliest I'll be able to che eat some more cheeses, you know, in two days from now. So but I'll definitely do it. Um, then he goes through uh, beer, wine, cider. You'll have store wine, has serving temperatures, uh, the proper glassware. You know, I, I just have a pint glass for this beer. I got a wine glass for this wine. And I got like a, another wine glass for the cider um, just because I, I don't really have lots of other glassware. Um, but... He said, um, the, in our opinion, that, that most of, let's see, let's see, it's, uh, it's easy to get stuck, sucked into the world of glasses. Uh, glassware manufacturers like to tell you that you should wear, you know, not wear, but you use certain glassware with certain, like, especially varieties of wine. Yeah, I guess. I think it's a lot of marketing hooey. Um, but, you know, wider bowls on, on the glass for for more complex wines and smaller ones for less complex wines and definitely don't use flutes for for champagne because you can't you can't get the aromas and flavors properly um and then they talk about tall thin walled uh vising glasses is, is ideal for is, is the ideal showcase for your fluffy headed wheat beers and chardonnays just seem to shine in, in a wine glass with a large bowl. Ciders have all manner of interesting region-specific receptacles from wooden cups to hollowed out ram's horns. But is their opinion, um, can you really detect a varietal fruit? Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, you don't need to invest in all that stuff. And let's see, it's just said, I've seen beer and wine tasting competitions where the wine was poured into immaculately polished stemware while the beer was served in plastic cups. So, I mean, bottom line is use, let's use halfway decent, you know, glassware. So for the most part, we got that going on. He's got these little things called quick lights. It's kind of hard to see because uh, it's kind of been blown out, the, the, um, the uh, exposure. But they have these little quick bites. I like, kind of give you like a little extra information about things. Like in this one, it says yeast to drink or not to drink. Like some beers have the, they leave the yeast in there. Not really much in wines, but in beers they do. Uh, what, how, whether to decant or not, how to decant, uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, then he's got cutting the tether tips for making new pairings no matter where you are. So um, he has uh, three, the quote, quote, three pillars of matchmaking. So comparable. Uh, so, you know, having like with like. Contrasting. So like having sweet and salty together or something like that. And then regional, what grows together goes together. So uh, in this case, not quite that in these pairings, but you know, we'll go through the pairings here in a little bit and why I chose them and, and what the reasoning behind them was. Um, he says, beware of extremes. Uh, love super sour beers and nuclear potent cheeses, but those bold assertive flavors are very difficult to pair properly. Um, I won't go through the rest of that. Um, he said, don't be afraid of failure. Um, let's see here. Uh, and then he goes through the pairings. So let's get in. Then, then at the end, he has some other advice and we'll get to that here in a little bit. So my first pairing is this one. No, no, this one. All right. So, um, page 62. Uh, the cheese he lists is the Quadrello di Bufala, uh, country of origins, Italy. Uh, the family is washed rind. Uh, the milk is water buffalo. The alternatives, and this is cool because he gives you, not only does he give you like, you know, origin, uh, the family of cheese it comes from, um, and what type of milk is using, whether it's, you know, cow, buffalo, goat, sheep. Um, and throughout the book, he kind of goes through these ex explanations as far as, you know, what type of milk you're using and like how diet affects the taste of cheese and the families and all that kind of stuff. So I won't go through all that. It's not like he has a section about it. It's like in those quick bites or like in his descriptions. So, um, so that's why, you know, like, why don't you talk about he does this? Because he doesn't have a chapter on it. He's not here to teach you about necessarily cheese. He's here to teach you how to, uh, some suggestions, and there are suggestions, in pairing cheese and, and a beverage. Um, so anyway, the, um, the beer that he has listed uh, is the 
bro, bro, I can't pronounce. It's like some Dutch thing, some, some Belgian thing. Uh, but it's the Ducasi de Bourgogne. So this is actually, I think, a different manufacturer. Um, I bought all this stuff at World Market, not World Market, Central Market, not the market thing. Um, because honestly, it was the easiest place to buy these types of things and these types of things because they're they're kind of like a specialty higher end specialty like you can't find some of these things like at a regular grocery store i could have gone to a cheese shop and i could have gone to a um you know i could have found a, a cheese monger here in san antonio but i don't know who they are and whether they have the stuff i want um and time wise it was just easier to go here um and then i got into a wine shop and bought these things um and they probably like like a like a place like Total Wine or like Specs locally or maybe even Gabriel's like the the better Gabriel's they probably would have had at least most of this stuff for me so but it was just one more one stop shop thing um, anyway country of origins Belgium uh, styles of Flanders red ale uh, other suggestions are the Cuvée de Jacobins Rouge the Rodenbach Grand Cru and the Frem or Fryum Flanders Red. So, uh, and I'm just going to read the entry here, you know, about the cheese, sticky and soft with an aroma of mushrooms. Your first taste of the Quadrello de Buffalo is going to leave a lasting impression guaranteed, especially a buffalo milk version of Telegio. Uh, Quadrello um, separates itself from the pack with the noticeable but not overwhelming, not overbearing triumvirate of funky, tangy, and yeasty flavors. I'm all about the funk, dude. I'm not a mushroom eater. I don't like eat mushrooms, but sometimes, but the flavor mushrooms gives is kind of cool. Kind of. Sometimes I don't really like it. Um, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, so the funky, tangy, and yeasty flavors that characterize water buffalo dairy products. Uh, definitely a picky cheese when it comes to pairing with uh, with a beverage. Don't even bother drinking German beers with it. So look for something with a strong enough yeast flavor of its own to keep the Quadrello from pushing the needle too far into fantastic overdrive. I don't know, I kind of like that. It goes best with Flanders Red Ale. Uh, if you've never had a sour beer before, brace yourself. That first sip can really throw you for a loop. Get used to it though. And the puckery smack can develop into an additional, I'm sorry, into an addiction that sends you searching for your next hit. See the current wild beer craze uh, in the United States and the universal veneration for Belgian breweries such as Rodenbach, Verhege, as exhibits A and B, which that's the Ducasi, not this one, but the Bro or whatever, Verhege, hey, whatever. Uh, Flanders Red Ale is a specific variety of sour beer made in the West Flanders region of Belgium. It's, it's an acidic and tart yet sort of sweet treat packed with flavors of raspberries, cherries, vanillas, vanilla, prunes, and cola. Now, he has a thing called the results. Flemish reds have enough backbone to tone down Quadrello's funk while the cheese cuts the acid, while the cheese cuts the acid. Together, they taste astonishingly close to cherry cheesecake and blackberry tart. A beautiful example of comparable flavors working in tandem. So, I chose this because it just sounded so like cool of a description and it's got funk and I don't really drink sour beer. So let's try that. Um, you know, I, I, I've, I've heard about this stuff. So I thought, why not try it? So let's taste the cheese first. And one of the things he says later in the book is like, you know, these exact pairings don't, don't try to focus so much on like getting the exact pairing. Like I don't, if I didn't get the exact brand, Oh, no, this is the right one. Okay. Maybe they're the only one that makes this one. I don't know. But let's say there's another Ducasi de Bourgogne from a different brand. Don't don't fret that you didn't get the exact brand and the exact, like, cheese. Like, this was more of a category cheese instead of a manufacturer, like he, he mentions in other things. Um, so, anyway. So, I'm going to take a thing of the cheese. I didn't even use the knife. I don't need it. And I'm going to taste the cheese first without the rind. Mm. Oh, nice and creamy. Yeah, there's a, actually there's a touch of sourness to it. Um, and a touch of funkiness. Maybe not necessarily the the, um, the mushroom. And I'm going to go back to his tasting notes just to kind of remind myself what he's talking about. 
not being here, but there's definitely a funkiness. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily a yeastiness, but there's like a, there's a, yeah, kind of a stinkiness to it. Add the rind. Oh, you know, I am going to go back into the book because he talks about how to eat, how to do this. So I'm going to try to find that. It says, after arranging the cheeses, blah, blah, blah. Let's see here. Chewing and tasting. This is what I wanted to. Here's the best way that he has found to combine the cheese and your selected beverage for the optimum pairing experience. Slice off a thumbnail sized chunk of cheese, then ball it up between your forefinger and thumb to get a, a feel for the texture and the oil content. Pop the cheese in your mouth, but don't chew it just yet. I mean, obviously I'm gonna eat the cheese and then drink the drink and then do the, do the pairing here. Um, press the cheese, to the cheese to the roof of your mouth with your tongue and then take a sip of the beverage. Make sure it's immersed in the beverage. Chew the cheese, uh, trying to combine it with the beverage as much as possible before swallowing. Wait at least 10 seconds to ensure you taste any lingering flavors on the finish. Take a sip of water or a bite of bread to cleanse your palate, then try another combo. All right, so let's let's get into this beer. Oh, first of all, um, so the cheese, right? So I, like I said, I bought Central Market. So I bought this, this hunk, this chunk was $6.27. If I bought the whole thing, uh, that actually works out to $21.99 per pound. So these are not cheap cheeses. It's not like, you know, getting Velveeta and crafty you know, American slices. This beer I bought uh, is $13.99, and it is a, they call them bombers. I don't know why. It is one pint, 9.4 fluid ounces. So 16 plus 9, 26 almost 27 ounces. I don't know why I'm doing that. I don't think it's going to pop open like a champagne bottle. But let's kind of treat it like that. A little bit of a little bit of carbonation in there. So let's pour some in here. I'm getting drunk tonight. No, I'm not. But I'm definitely going to probably drink, well, drink most of it. So yeah, there's like this really like carbonated aroma to it. There's like this almost uh, smoky, um, I want to say cola, but there's like this, um, man, there's like this, there's a funkiness to it. There's also this uh, sweetness to it. I guess a bit of sour, um, almost like a Chinese food thing, like a soy sauce thing. That's super tasty. It's like a really tart, like cherry, cherry and blackberry, like, like candy roll up. Um, but tart, not really sweet. Um, and, I, and I guess that's where the sour is coming from. And it's not super sour. I mean, I've had some sour beers like, oh my goodness. Now, this is like light on the sour. Um, it it a touch of sweetness to it. Um, and like and like that those berry flavors and all that. It's really pleasant. So let's, let's take his advice. And we're going to take, you know, I guess it's a thumbnail thing. We're going to roll it around. I guess I should have gotten a napkin for myself, but I got jeans, right? Jeans, jeans count as napkins, right? So I'm gonna roll it around, and it's it's kind of like it's kind of like slimy. It's kind of cool. So I pop cheese in my mouth. Oh my God. Like, 
He talked about like a, a cheesecake. It really was like a cherry cheesecake. I mean, not exactly, like it, but but there was this, there was that creamy texture. If it didn't happen at first, but um, yeah, no, don't lick your fingers. Man, that was good. That was. Man, I mean, I've been pairing wine with cheese, and and oh, I've been doing it all wrong. That's legit. That is legit. That is, that is, that is pretty fantastic. I have to say, dude, you're, you're, you're crushing it, man. All right. So, man, that's really nice. So moving on, we're going to get to this one. I had actually on the wine, what I had, couple of different ones. I had some Beaujolais in there because I had some Beaujolais in the house, but I was like, uh, I want to do something different. So this is the one um, I just don't ever have. And um, so let me, let me cleanse the palate here. So the next one we're going to do, oh, don't, don't do that. Well, probably so just going to get the cheese off of the, the fork there. All right, so I'm sorry, a lot of dead air. So the next one we're going to do is the, <clears throat> the cheese is the Osau Irati or Irati. Country origin is France. Um, and that's this cheese right here. Okay. Um, it's the family is pressed and uncooked Pyrenees style. The milk is sheep. Um, the alternatives are Le Berger Basque, Grafton Village Cheese Bear Hill, and Landmark uh, Anabasque. All right. Um, the wine, he has the Domaine de Durban Muscat de Bomes de Venise. I actually have the um, Domaine des Bernadins. So, I mean, it's basically gonna be the same thing. Um, other suggestion is this one. <laughs> Uh, and the Domaine de Fenwalet Muscat de Bombs de Venise. So he gives you three different manufacturers. Um, the country of origin is France, and the style is a Muscat Blanc. So about the cheese, oh, uh, I paid $6 for this chunk, and it comes out to $19.99 per pound. And for this, this is a half bottle of, of wine, uh, and the wine comes out to... Twenty-three thirty-nine. Uh, actually, it's twenty-five ninety-nine. I had bought, um, uh, kind of like I had bought like last week's episode. I bought, I bought a bunch of wine at Central Market that day. Um, but uh, I bought uh, six bottles, not of this, but six bottles in general, and uh, it came out to twenty-three thirty-nine after the ten percent discount. Uh, but it's normally twenty-five ninety-nine. All right. Because they had this awesome wine there from from Chateau. Uh, no, was it that one? No. How did I get ten percent off? I didn't buy. I don't know. I don't know how I got ten percent off. I don't see. I don't see having six wines on there, but it said ten percent off. Oh, I know why. Because I bought three bottles of. Um, I bought three bottles of uh, Domaine Saint Michel Brut. Because uh, what the um, tenth anniversary episode you saw the, the the me doing the thing, well I bought three bottles of like American like cheaper stuff so I could practice so that's why I got the ten percent off. Okay, anyway enough of that. About the cheese, uh, Osau Irati. I know I'm butchering that. I'm sorry. Uh, it's one of the world's oldest cheeses, uh, and one of the easiest to pair despite its sheep's milk provenance. Cheese from ewe's milk tends to embody Woolly lanolin notes. This firm, rich ivory delight originated in the Western Pyrenees 
between the Basque and Bern regions of France and Spain, where shepherds allowed their sheep to graze in both high and low elevations in a process known as transhumans, uh, humanins, humanins. Um, and that's one of the quick bites, which actually was a quick bite for this one. I'll, maybe I'll read that one for you. Uh, you can tell if you're, if you're th this cheese comes from a farmstead or a traditional dairy by the sheep stamp on in the rind. A head, a head on use head means it's a farm variety and a side view means it's dairy made. And I have a highly doubt I'm going to see anything like that because I don't have the entire wheel and I didn't ask them about it. Um, Expect earthy flavors of a salty churned butter, cracked wheat, and roasted nuts with hints of herbs and an underlying caramel sweetness that makes this cheese, makes even cheese newbies fall in love. Uh, goes best with Muscat Blanc. The term Muscat encompasses not a single grape, but more than 200 varieties ranging in color and style used to produce lush, balanced, generally sweeter wines. It's also one of the oldest grapes around. Even the ancient Greeks were drinking this, this Muscat Blanc. Of the myriad Muscat clones, Muscat Blanc and the wines made from it are particularly agreeable to cheese uh, with their intoxicating floral aromas uh, and strong honey presence on the palate. Uh, the results. The Muscat we found that pairs with uh, this cheese is uh, made from a, the small aromatic Blanc of Petites Grands grapes, which produces a wine with a valley in springtime nose of violets and rose petals. Those rose petals carry over into the flavor, joining ripe peaches and apricot preserves. Add the Osau Arity to the wine's cloying sugars retreat, forming a perfect counterbalance between sweet and salty. Hey, did I mention that, that counterbalance, that contrasting? Uh, with the sweetness reduced, the wine's fruitiness steps forward, pairing with the richness of the cheeses like peaches and cream or fresh yogurt. Transhuman, humanants, transhumanants, transhumans. Yeah, okay. I'll put the word down there. Uh, mountain cheeses such as Comte and Osaurity often find their provenance in the grand tradition of transhumans, Latin for overground. Um, which involves migrating livestock to higher elevations in the summer and lower elevations in the winter. This practice allows the grasses of the lower pastures to grow in the summer, leaving an ample supply of hay for the animals when they return in the winter. There is a certain romance to cheese made in this manner, often inside small stone huts where the milk is poured into grand copper kettles, heated over wood fires, and eventually formed into massive wheels uh, to bring down the mountain bring down the mountain to market. These cheeses tend to have deeper, more vivid flavors due to the fresh vegetation consumed by the cows on the higher pastures. So if you're starting to pick out the taste of herbs or flowers in that cheese, chances are good transhumans played a part. So let's see if we get all that good stuff. And the picture, yes, sometimes there's pictures of it and it's maybe kind of hard to see. It looks like it has like some type of like jam on that so or jelly or whatever so that looks kind of cool i'm actually going to use the knife to cut this so we're going to cut a little chunk there get a little bit of the rind and then just going to break off some eat some of that oh that's good now if you notice he says it's sheep's milk but in the transhumans he talked about cow's milk so I just think whatever whatever the animal that you're doing is goes up and down the hill. I kind of the reason I like that or I, I gravitate towards that is I kind of feel like this kind of like um, um, diurnal shift in wine or in grapes where you have hot days and cold nights, and the hot days allow the sugars to increase, and then the cool nights makes the acids increase. So you're getting higher acid, higher sugar content. Uh, which can give you high acid, high alcohol. It's tasty. It's not as potent as this cheese, uh, but it's real tasty. Um, let's eat it with the rind. I kind of get those earthy flavors and the salty churned butter. Maybe not the cracked wheat and roasted nuts, 
but I do get a bit of herbs. So maybe or maybe not this went through that type of trans, whatever it was called, but we'll see here in a minute. With the rind, I actually get some, I do get kind of that, that earthiness, that almost grassiness. So maybe it did do that. All right, so let's, let's get into the wine here. I'm going to corv in it. I don't typically corv in dessert wines because the sugar content can really kind of mess with things. But considering I, I don't want to open this up and I'm not going to necessarily crush it. I just want to just take a, a small a small enough amount out of here. That's plenty. Here we go. Um, I said how much I paid for the wine, right? Yeah, I did. Okay. So it's all cloudy because, you know, I, the, the, the gas, but it, it's still kind of, it's got this like almost pink peach color. I don't know how much of that is the, the, no, oh, even, even, even over the white plate, it still has that. God, it smells awesome. Apricots for days on this. I don't know why I put the book over there. Very apricot, very peachy. It's a delicious wine. Um, definitely sweet. Um, the apricots and the peach. Um, nectarine. Like really luscious nectarine. Um, orange candy. Um, of course, all the sugar and all that. So let's... Now this is kind of a hard cheese, so um, I don't know if the whole like doing like I did with the other one will work, but we're gonna kind of ball it up. So hard cheese, not really oily, not slimy like the other one. Mm, that was tasty, but I'm having a hard time like really nailing down the necessarily the the, the combination here. I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to do it one more time. So I get a little bit here. For me, the herbaceousness really comes through. Almost like a bitterness. Like I think because I got more rind than cheese on that second one. Um, kind of mushroomy and like literally like grass. Like, like I got face planted in, in like some fresh cut grass and hay. It's kind of cool. Um, so let's see what, what they said. It was like, he said peaches and cream and fresh yogurt. So it could be just that the actual cheese I'm using and, and, and since I got a lot of rind on the second time I'm getting that, but I like it. I like the earthiness, kind of a funkiness. It's kind of cool. I like it. All right, let's move on to the next cheese. So this one was the only one I couldn't really get the exact cheese. Um, I just really wanted this pairing. We'll, I'll explain why. I mean, I probably could have got a different cheese and, and a different cider, but I just really wanted this pairing. And I'm hoping that this one will be pretty close. All right, so the cheese is supposed to be vintage cheese of Montana, the, the Mountina. Country of origin is United States, Montana. Family is Alpine style washed rind. Milk is cow. Um, the alternatives are Fontina Valdosta. That's this one here. Uh, Central Coast Holy Cow or the Parish Hill Vermont Herdsman. So I went with this one. Um, and then the uh, cider is, again, I think it's the exact cider, the Crown Valley Brewing Blackberry Cider from the United States, Missouri. Uh, style is Blackberry Marionberry, not the D.C. mayor. Um, right, that was the mayor, wasn't it? Like the crackhead or whatever. Um, 
Anyway, speaking of that, so the other two suggest the other suggestions are the two towns Maid Marian, the Bishop Crackberry, uh, and the Bold Rock Blackberry. So um, uh, I paid six forty seven for this chunk of the cheese that comes at the seventeen forty nine per pound, and for the Crackberry for a six pack, I paid nine ninety nine. Okay, so about the cheese, cheese making is in vintage cheese co-founder Daryl Heap's blood. That's the the actual cheese you're supposed to use. Um, a third generation cheesemaker like his brother Dwayne and a Kraft Foods uh, grunt at the age of 13. That's kind of cool. He honed his chops on cheeses that probably never saw the insides of a discriminating cheesemonger's display case, you think? Uh, now at the helm of his own business in Bozeman, Montana, a state with a once thriving dairy industry that suffered in recent decades, Heap's got a stunner on his hands, M Mountina, is a brined alpine style cheese similar to Fontina that definitely balances a mouth coating creaminess with the hearty warmth of French onion soup with a pinch of funk and grass tossed in. Uh, be sure to serve it closer to room temperature and let the, the menagerie of flavors come out to play. Goes best with Marionberry or Blackberry cider. As with all ciders, whether or not they're teeming with other flavors, a little sugar goes a long way. Some cideries seem to take the addition of a second fruit as an invitation to crank up the sweetness and obliterate the line between cider and Kool-Aid. I'm hoping this is not what happens here, but since they suggested this exact one, probably not happening. Um, but when approached with a little finesse, these multi-fruit ciders can really deliver something special, complex, and most of all fun. A good blackberry or marionberry cider uh, needs to balance the delicate profile of the apples with more assertive berries. Uh, and that balance is best achieved with an with actual fruit, not an extract. It should be alive with the flavors of shocking fresh picked berries. And as a result, offer mod a modicum of tartness. If it's a full on sour, then it almost certainly surely was inoculated with a special bacteria or yeast. So it says pear, the results pear blackberry cider with Montina and your reward is peanut butter and jelly. Peanut butter jelly tap. Sorry. Um, not that I think this will be exactly peanut butter jelly because it's not the exact two items, but hopefully it'll be close. And he says, no joke. Uh, this combination is so evocative of a creamy peanut butter and blackberry jelly spread over slices of unobtrusive white bread. You'll swear it came. You swear it came in a plastic lunchbox. And there was no quick bite to read on that one. So let's check this out. Let's cut a little hunk on there. Um, so we're gonna taste a little bit of the cheese first. Should have kept the uh, thing here. Hmm. It's not necessarily funky. What does he say? I know it's not the exact cheese, but as far as French onion soup, I can kind of see a little bit of onion there. A um, little bready. Um, actually, kind of a little bit um, savory. Kind of like, you know, the broth in French onion soup. I can see that. Um, funk and grass, maybe not that. But again, we're not talking the exact cheese. But um, it's really nice. Let's have a little bit with the rind. Though this one may be one of the type of rinds you don't eat. Because it has like a label on it. So maybe I should peel the label off. There's the rind. This one's fine. The rind has a little more complexity, though. I had just a t the tiniest bit of rind on it. All right, so let's crack open the crackberry. I know I'm all fancy in a wine glass. 
So yeah, tons of like fruit on it. I mean, they said this was uh, cranberries, blackberries, apples, and crack with a asterisk. Asterisk. I get the apple for sure, like apple and, and probably blackberry. Maybe not the cranberry so much on the nose. Let's taste it. There's definitely the apple, and there's actually a bit of tartness to it, a little bit of sour. So, like you was talking about the the, the sourness on it. Um, I guess the blackberries there too. Not of course the cranberry. Maybe it's, you know, even though cranberry is the first one listed, I don't know what the exact um, uh, percentages of apples, cranberries, and, and blackberries. Um, but as far as cider is concerned, for the most part, it's going to. How I understand cider, it's going to be usually majority apple and then they'll maybe add other stuff in there so it's you know it's adult apple juice come on let's let's get real dude and i love apple juice there's definitely a tartness and a sourness to it let's there's not much it's i mean you can like try to pinch it but there's not much to pinch it's very very firm cheese So without the rind, it's a little bit more pliable. It's not peanut butter and jelly, but again, we're not doing the exact same cheeses and, and, and cider, but it's very tasty. Oops. So of the three, this one for me didn't work as much, but you know what? Hey, it's okay because he even mentions it later in the book. Like, you know, don't, don't take these, don't take these parents as gospel. Um, so final thoughts, just say, just because I mentioned it there, not only are there exceptions to the rule, but exceptions are the norm. Um, I won't go through the whole thing there. Uh, but he says, variances within examples of the same style beer, wine, cider from different breweries, <clears throat> wineries, cideries don't change the final outcome all that much. Washed rind cheeses play nice with wine and cider. With beer, it's a scuffle. Um, sorry, a cider is unquestionably, in his opinion, the easiest beverage to pair with cheese. But the highest highs and the lowest lows come from beer and wine. Uh, and then it says, we don't always agree on which pairing works. So between the two of them, um, and I won't go through it, but they basically, they, they had some, they had some disagreements, like for real disagreements. Um, so, and then they go through, they, then they have some uh, additional cheese pairings with, with beverages in the index. Um, you know, I, this book alone, just, even if I hadn't done the actual pairings was very informative. Um, it's a, big weak point for me with cheese. Um, not that I'm necessarily going to get quizzed, um, in the court about cheeses, but if I'm going to be doing food pairings, this might come up. It might be, and then he asked me a style of cheese and what would I pair with it? So this 75 pairings is a good, like broad thing to kind of give you an idea of what would might work. Um, because, you know, I'm not saying that these are the only pairings that are out there. Obviously they're not, but, um, I think it was, a, it's a good idea. Gives you some good stuff. You know, I'm going to try this Fontina again um, just to just to kind of give it another shot. Um, all right, eat it. Chew on it. I 
I mean, if I search for the peanut butter and jelly thing, it's kind of there. There's a little nuttiness that uh, comes with the cheese and the berries, but I think if it was the exact cheese and, and, and cider pairing, it probably would taste just like it. Also, another thing, another note is how he, he describes or how he suggests to uh, eat it. I like that idea, but I feel like you have to practice it. Like it's, I, I'm so used to like, as soon as I put, you know, the drink in my mouth, I just want to swallow it. Like it's, it was like kind of hard to like coordinate keeping the liquid in your mouth and then start chewing and actually swallowing everything. So that takes a little practice, but I like that. My favorite pairing was this, was the beer. And I think it was because it was so, such a like cool pairing. Um, it really just goes in order. This is my favorite. This is my second favorite. This is my least favorite. I like it, but I also don't really care for the cider that much. Um, I feel it's kind of thin and a little weak. Um, it is a, not quite refrigerator temperature. It, it did kind of warm up, but I mean, he didn't go through, I mean, he goes through in here about serving temperatures of, of these beverages. And in general, we drink everything too cold anyway. So having a little more warmth to it should add to it. But yeah, I had a great time. And how long is this? 45 minutes, that's not too bad. I had a great time. And I highly recommend you do this. Uh, the book back here is listed as $24.95 US, $33.95 Canada. I don't know if you can get it cheaper from a bookstore, or Amazon, or Barnes & Noble, whatever your, 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 your online book thing of choice. But this should be in your arsenal, especially if you're like in the Psalm side of things. It should be an arsenal along with a ton of other non-wine books. All right, so that's going to do it for this week. Um, as always, click the links above to friend me up. I'll have all the information down below, uh, plus a bunch of links, probably affiliate links and all that good stuff. Um, hit the PayPal button or hit the PayPal link below. And um, yeah, we'll see everyone again next time.